Welcome back to our study of the life of Christ. We're now beginning to look at the individual Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to the way each one is unique and the themes that each one emphasizes. And we'll also have separate lessons where we look at particular passages from each of the Gospels. Starting with Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is about the Messiah, the promised deliverer, the anointed one, the Christ in Greek or English, who will deliver Israel from their current condition, which in the time of Jesus Christ is being dominated by the Roman Empire. As you know from history, they have been dominated by various empires through history, and yet they were told that they were God's special people in God's special land. And so there were a variety of ideas of what the promised Messiah would be doing, but there was a hope of a Messiah among the Jewish people worldwide, particularly, of course, uh, around Jerusalem and in uh, what we call the Holy Land. It is significant that Matthew starts out his gospel with this genealogy and that he identifies Jesus Christ as very Jewish and a likely candidate to be the Messiah. To say that he is a son of David is to say that he is a son of their greatest king when they were an independent kingdom. To say that he is a son of Abraham is to emphasize his Jewishness, that he is indeed a descendant of the father of the Jews. So who is Matthew? We know from the Gospels that he is someone that Jesus finds in Capernaum, a city on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And we know that when Jesus finds him, he is at work as a tax collector. Tax collectors uh, are not popular in most places, but if your nation has a sense of its ultimate place in the world to be a strong and independent kingdom, God's own people, and if you have a history of being dominated by world empires, then you are looking to be independent of them. And the person who collects his taxes is unpopular, especially for every loyal uh, Jewish citizen. Perhaps uh, it's in Galilee. Perhaps he was working for Herod Antipas, who was the puppet king of the Romans. But he was taking taxes for the people who had taken over their a country. And it is to such an outcast that Jesus speaks walking around in Capernaum. He finds Matthew collecting taxes and says to Matthew, follow me. Matthew does, and he gives a dinner for Jesus. What is significant about this dinner is that Matthew has invited many tax collectors and sinners to attend. And as you probably know from your studies of Scripture, uh, that was not popular with the religious establishment. They criticized Jesus for eating with uh, tax collectors and sinners, with the outcast of the Jewish establishment. That's when Jesus answers them about who needs a physician. Not those who are well, but those who are sick. He is there to serve the needs of the outcasts, sinners, the tax collectors being a primary example. So this is how we learn who Matthew is. It's, in, uh, it's throughout the Gospels, but this is Matthew's account of how he came to follow Jesus and how Jesus made a point at the dinner that Matthew gave for him, that he was here to reach the sinners. Beyond this, it's important to understand as you study the four Gospels that Matthew is elsewhere called Levi. It is obvious that he had two names, and some people called him by one, some called him by the other, Matthew Levi. And of course, we learn that Matthew is an apostle.
There are a list of apostles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, the book of Acts. I've chosen some to help us identify uh, how Matthew is listed. If you come down to the next to the last line in the table, Matthew himself lists himself as Matthew the tax collector, the rest simply giving him his formal name, Matthew. Now, we're going to notice in a moment that elsewhere, he is identified as a son of Alphaeus, which makes people wonder, was well, he related to another apostle, James, the son of Alphaeus, that you see at the bottom of the table? But the conclusion is that he is not. Nothing says that he is. And as you'll notice in one, two, three, four of the uh, cells in the table, uh, list of apostles uh, take the trouble to point out some who are brothers, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And since never are Matthew and uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, called to be uh, brothers, there's no reason to believe they are. Here's how we know that Matthew and Levi are the same people. As we noticed, uh, it comes from Matthew 9.9, 9, Jesus sees Matthew sitting at a tax booth and he calls him. And then Jesus eats in the house, it says, with many tax collectors and sinners. Mark's account says that Jesus sees Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth and calls him. And then Jesus eats in his house with many tax collectors and sinners. Luke says that Jesus sees a tax collector named Levi and calls him. And then Levi prepares him a great feast at his house with a large company of tax collectors and others. So obviously it's the same event and Matthew and Levi are the same person. So, who says Matthew wrote Matthew? First of all, you should realize that the headings, the names of the books of the four Gospels, are not a part of the original text. They were added years later. So the text of his Gospel does not say that Matthew wrote the book. None of the four Gospels name the author in the text. But for a very long people, for a very long time, people have said that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote these Gospels. The oldest record we have that puts them together that way is from A.D. 180, about that time, when Irenaeus, a bishop in uh, what we call France, wrote, Matthew also issued a written Gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. Now, he goes on to mention the others as well. But here we find a clear reference. Not long, uh, a generation after the last of the apostles has passed away, where they're already saying that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the four Gospels as we know them. It wasn't until the 1700s, 1800s, that a significant number of Bible scholars began to question whether or not Matthew wrote the book we call Matthew. There are different reasons. Uh, and uh, the arguments uh, are really probably weakened by the fact that they're not all saying the same thing. But a common objection is that Matthew seems to have an awful lot that comes right out of Mark. Mm, about 90% of what is in Mark is also in Matthew. And so reasoning that it is unlikely that you would take an old gospel and take some of it out People guess that Matthew took the already existing Gospel of Mark and added things to it. And then, working from that hypothesis, they argue that an apostle, Matthew, would not quote from a non-apostle, Mark. The greatest weakness of that argument is that it's an assumption on top of an assumption. And there's just not reason enough to reject the centuries and centuries of agreement that Matthew is indeed the author of Matthew. So when did he write this gospel? There's an important clue in timing of virtually all the New Testament books. 
that has to do with the temple in Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Matthew, events happen in the temple. And importantly, near the end of the Gospel, Jesus predicts the destruction of that temple, which came some 40 years after Jesus died. Another uh, time marker, uh, or the time marker associated with the temple, is that uh, tired of the rebellions that they had seen in the area, the Roman Empire completely destroys the temple in AD 70. They destroy the whole city of Jerusalem, and by and large, the Jews leave Jerusalem. The way that fits together in figuring out when Matthew was written is the fact that Matthew does not report or even indicate in any way that when he's writing, the temple has been destroyed. It would be very odd indeed for him to have included the prophecy of Jesus that the temple would soon be destroyed and then not report that the prophecy had been fulfilled. It is a logical conclusion that he must have written before that happened. If indeed Mark wrote his gospel first, you need to give some time for that. And then, although uh, it's not written out in the slide that's in front of you, you also need to consider uh, the book of the Gospel of Luke, which, uh, ass which asserts that others had already written some gospels. And we can, without going into too much detail at this time, we can be pretty sure that Luke wrote his gospel before the last event in the book of Acts, because Luke wrote Luke and Acts. And the last event of the book of Acts leaves you hanging with um, the apostle Paul in prison in Rome, and it builds up to this great thing. It doesn't tell you what happens. And so there's every reason to believe that Luke Acts was written before Paul was uh, released from prison in Rome. And we can look historically and determined that that would have been um, in the late 60s. So with all that put together, we assume that the Gospel of Matthew could have been written around A.D. 65, before the destruction of Jerusalem, but perhaps after some other Gospels had been written. Where? There are two major possibilities. One is that it could have been Antioch in Syria. Some people base that on similarities of other people who wrote there, but um, I think uh, more logically, we might look at uh, what Antioch was. Antioch was one of uh, four or five of the biggest cities of the Roman Empire. You look at this map, and of course you have Rome, which maybe was a million people, Ephesus, Antioch, Alexandria, and off on the left below Rome, uh, cut off from this map, is Carthage. Well, of these, uh, Antioch could have been maybe half a million people, and it was significant enough that the Romans considered it the uh, eastern outpost capital for the Roman Empire. Now, down below there is Jerusalem, and then you need to go back to um, the book of Acts again, where we can time things fairly well. And you see that by Acts, uh, by the time of persecutions under the hands of, of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, the many of the Christians have moved and, and centered their work in Antioch. Now, at least at first, apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But eventually, Antioch, becomes the center of the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. That makes sense, it's being uh, such a central and important city. So there are reasons to believe that he might have gone up the coast to uh, Antioch, the bigger city, and, and spread the gospel from there. However, uh, since it's very, very likely that the uh, temple had not been destroyed when Matthew was written, it could certainly have been written from Palestine or Jerusalem, and the book certainly does have a very Jewish focus in it. So possibly right where you would expect Matthew to be, in the area of Palestine, perhaps even Jerusalem. But there are some reasons to believe that perhaps he was, by the time he wrote this book, settled in the larger city of Antioch, uh, the, the important Roman city.
I've spent some time looking at the structure of Matthew. And it is an intricate structure. And what I've been reading lately encourages us to look at different structures within Matthew. Uh, that's why uh, I'm saying that there is an intricate structure. Now, why do you care about the structure of Matthew? Well, since he doesn't expressly say, this is the point of this book, or this is the theme of this book, you have to look at the contents, including the way the material is arranged, to find out what are the themes, what, uh, what point is he making. And so there are different ways that you can see that the Gospel of Matthew is organized. We mentioned in a previous lesson that the Gospel of Matthew is divided up into sections, uh, indicated on these tables by the green uh, uh, rows, where there is a discourse. The sections of Matthew alternate between narrative and discourse, active action and speeches. At the same time, the information is arranged uh, geographically from place to place. And it is largely arranged chronologically, as you expect a biographical, a sermonic biography, as our textbook calls it, uh, to progress. However, sometimes within that general chronology, Matthew does group together similar stories that uh, as we read them in the other Gospels, may not have happened exactly at that time. Matthew doesn't say they happened at exactly that time. So you have action moving from place to place. And through uh, the first 18 chapters, Jesus is entirely based in Galilee. Only in 26, 27, and 28 uh, is he exclusively in Jerusalem. And from 18 through 28, through those uh, 10 chapters, he goes back and forth between the adjoining across on the east side of the Jordan region of Perea, uh, short visits into, Jerusalem, into Judea and up to Jerusalem. By the way, up to Jerusalem always means uphill, not up to the north uh, in, in biblical writing. So you have these fewer chapters certainly focused on a shorter period of time, especially in chapters 26 through 28, uh, where he has moved from Galilee to back and forth between Perea and Judea, including Jerusalem. So what do we get out of the, the geographic structure? Well, it appears that the Gospel of Matthew is presenting this humble, preacher who preached beautiful sermons like the Sermon on the Mount and brave sermons that condemned those who were uh, hypocritical and focused sermons like those when he sent out his 12 disciples and the parables, the stories that help people to know what the kingdom of God is like. Yes, it does move chronologically. As we've mentioned before, you have to go to another gospel, to John, to see evidence that it was perhaps a three-year ministry. But you do see him going back and forth in, in the gospel of, uh, of Matthew, and it does follow mostly chronological order. As we mentioned, you have these sections that not only do you see that they are sections because maybe you got a red-letter Bible with the words of Jesus in red and you have whole chapters in red, but there are also transition verses that mark these separate sections. If you look at the words in italic on the green stripes on this uh, table, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says, when Jesus had finished these sayings, uh, and he had come down the mountain, chapter 8, verse 1. Then you see activities in, in chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 10 is another uh, discourse when he's telling the 12 what their mission will be. But it says, after chapter 10, in the first verse of the next chapter, it says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities, uh, meaning the Galilean cities. There are activities, 
in chapters 11 and 12, and then another uh, discourse section. He tells a number of parables about what God's kingdom is about. At the end of that section, in verse 53, it says, And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his own hometown. And then it talks about he went back to Capernaum. That, again, is followed by uh, a section of activities that take place in 14 through 17. Then there is a sermon in uh, chapter 18 on humility and forgiveness. And then there's the same uh, transition line. 19.1 says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. There is a great deal of uh, activity in chapters 19 through 22, but then another section of discourses when he speaks against the Pharisees and talks about the end is coming. But at the end of chapters 23 through 25, you have the same transition line. When Jesus had finished all the sayings, he said to his disciples, and then you move on to chapters 26 through 28, the events that occur uh, in the last week of Jesus uh, before his death. Notice the pattern in those italicized lines. 728, when Jesus had finished these sayings. 11.1, when Jesus, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples. Chapter 13, verse 53, and when Jesus had finished these parables. 19.1, now when Jesus had finished these sayings. 26.1, when Jesus had finished all these sayings. Obviously, Matthew is telling us that he has just concluded a collection of things that Jesus said in every case. Notice also that in most of these cases, it also moves on to another place. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 1, he'd been on the mountain and he comes down from it. Uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, he's got the 12 ready to go out and he goes out and preaches, not still based in his home base of Capernaum, but in the cities of Galilee. And after he gives his parables, uh, he returns back home. Uh, and then uh, most significantly, the move uh, in chapter 19, 1, that he uh, leaves Galilee and he goes down towards Judea. There are two major divisions that are in white stripes on the table in front of you. The beginning of the ministry of Jesus in Matthew is marked in chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach. And then, near the end of his time in Galilee, chapter 16, verse 21 says, from that time, notice you have a section that starts in 417, from that time, here's the preaching ministry of Jesus. Chapter 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. So you have this section of preaching from chapter 4 down into chapter 16. And in chapter 16, he begins, Jesus begins to turn the attention of his disciples. And Matthew turns the attention of his readers to the upcoming uh, abuse and mistreatment of Jesus that's about to come. And then soon after making that transition in 1621, you move towards Jesus going to Jerusalem for the final time. So there is an intricate structure to Matthew. And when you look at a certain passage, you'll discover it better if you look at it within its division of the section of that gospel, and then interpret that in light of how is the story moving from section to section. Now that we've looked at the gospel of Matthew as a whole, we have a structure, we have a writer, we have a place in time, we're going to begin to look at what the content is. And we'll use your textbook's uh, suggested uh, thematic arrangements of the material. These are important themes in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. 
And we'll look at particular verses in our next session, uh, passages that teach these things. Remember, of course, that we started out saying that Matthew is about Jesus as the Messiah. As the Messiah, we understand that God sent Jesus, or as it's worded here, Jesus is from God. And Matthew, more than anyone else, speaks often of how Jesus fulfills Scripture. But also in the Gospel of Matthew, as well as the other Gospels, but also a theme in Matthew is that God says that Jesus is his son. God actually speaks and identifies this as his son, which is much more than the original um, concept that um, not the original, the, the contemporary concept of what a Messiah would be at the time that Jesus came into the world. But it is about how Jesus serves or helps Israel to serve their purpose. A theme in Matthew is that Jesus saves Israel and in so doing, he saves the world. As we mentioned, it starts out with Jesus as the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But Jesus also relates to Gentiles throughout his ministry. And at the end of Matthew, he commissions the apostles to make disciples of all nations. And so Jesus is from God, God's own son. Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, but he is here to save the whole world as well. The next great theme is that Jesus is the ultimate authority. His miracles serve a purpose. They show that he has authority over nature itself, over disease, over demons. But also, Matthew teaches that Jesus holds supreme authority over judgment day, over the eternal state. He will judge all in the end. The fourth theme is that Jesus serves people. He serves people on the one hand as the master teacher who teaches the deeper meanings of things that people have already heard from God's word. He is one who calls for repentance. He preaches that God wants people to repent before it's too late. But he also compassionately responds to people and heals their suffering. And finally, the theme is that Jesus makes disciples. That is, he is actually creating his church. And only Matthew speaks of the fact that Jesus has a mission to build his church. And he teaches his people how to follow him. We will develop those with particular passages from Matthew in our next uh, session. It may take two sessions to cover all that material. That's it for this one.